This is the Commission Church Online. Welcome to our podcast. We want to be a church who brings heaven on earth through the word of God and the love of Christ. I pray this week's message blesses you. The message of Christmas is always rooted in the fact that the God that loves you sent his son to die on the cross for you and for me. Because our sin cannot be ever made up. Like we would never be able to make up for our sins and our sinful nature. So God in his infinite mercy sent his son to die on the cross to take away all our sins for once and for all. And it doesn't matter if you sinned yesterday, today, or if you'll sin tomorrow. Remember that you are covered in the blood of Jesus. Amen. And that blood guarantees that he is with you and he is with me. Today, I want to I wanna speak on the subject, great joy. The second promise of Christmas, and there are so many promises that comes with the birth of Jesus, but the second promise is the promise of great joy. The joy that the Christian has inside of him and inside of her is a joy that's unexplainable. It's a joy that is so deeply rooted, and it's a joy that just that, that just griddles the very uh, nature, undergriddles the very nature of who we are as Christians. Thinking back about this year, it was probably one of the most stressful years in my life. I talked about a stressful week, but going back into this year, the beginning of the year, uh, going into the middle of the year, and early this year, I was actually telling Sonia about how I felt like my anxiety levels were rising. I never had to deal with anxiety, but early this, this year, I, I had my bout with anxiety, and I had multiple people around me come alongside with me and pray about it. The stress levels kind of multiplied in over the last two quarters of the year where there were so many things that were happening. And as these stress levels were climbing was when uh, right after Thanksgiving, the Christmas stations started playing the old favorite. It's the most wonderful time of the year. And I would, I, I would think to myself, I was like, Lord, I wish this was the most wonderful time of the year. But for, personally for me, I was going through a very, very, very hard time. Normally, this song would bring cheer to me. Normally, this was something that would uplift my Christmas spirits, my, my spirits within me, and we would get ready for the Christmas season. The, the lights were being put up immediately after Thanksgiving or the week of Thanksgiving. The lights were going up. The decorations were going up. The Christmas trees being put up. Everything. We're in holiday spirits, but not this year. The pressures of life had overwhelmed us and uh, sometimes Christmas is and sometimes it isn't the happiest season of all. And in the last four years of our church and uh, church ministry, man, each year several families have anticipated the pain of going through their first Christmas without a loved one who had died probably in the same year or the previous year. Five families in this church have, in recent months, gone through some tragic losses, some unexplainable losses, losses that we cannot even begin to explain and fathom and explain in words, but leading up to Thanksgiving and even after, our family in particular, even though we didn't go through a loss of such or a death in our family, it felt like the whole world was coming down because, or, or, or just falling apart around us because we had, we, had, we, had, we had sickness over sickness over sickness in our family. Our girls were ill. And right when they were getting better, the week of, week of sickness left and they were getting better, here comes another set of sickness. And, and they had a, a flu or whatever it is and the doctors couldn't explain what it was. So three weeks of back-to-back sickness. And for parents who are sitting here and you have kids, you know that when kids get sick, you are super stressed. Like you have no idea what you're going to do. You feel like your whole world is crashing around you. And all, all when this was going on, Right, I am, I, am, I am trying to grapple with the idea. Sonia's like, man, we need to put up the tree. We need to put up the lights. And I'm like, I don't have it in me. I don't have it in me. I can't gather myself with everything going on, with the craziness and with the deaths and with the sickness and, and all of this stuff. This year has been a messed up year. And I said, with all of this, I don't feel like being in a celebratory mood. I just don't. I remember Sonia leading into me and saying, tap into that joy. 
tap into the joy of the Lord. You know, and, and yet no matter how stressful everything gets, the story of Christ's advent retold every Christmas season proclaims this good news of joy. So my, 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 my question and the thing that I, that, I, that I struggle with is this, how can we authentically as Christians connect with joy when our hearts are aching or our lives are strained to the breaking point like mine was? How can we sing joy to the world when actually our world is falling apart? When joy is the last thing on our radar, when joy is the last emotion and the last feeling that we are facing today. Sometimes we struggle to grasp the biblical view of joy because of the way it's defined and described in our Western culture today. In particular, we often confuse joy with happiness. And this is what I want to clarify this morning because if you look throughout the Bible, there's very, very rarely in the Old Testament, the Bible talks about somebody being happy. In the New Testament, there's no account whatsoever of happiness as an emotion. There is no account of it whatsoever. See, happiness and joy are two different things. Happiness simply means experiencing positive emotion or the state of being happy. See, happiness comes and goes. Happiness is this emotion that you feel when you watch your kids open up their Christmas presents and you're like, wow, the, the happiness they have in their face. Come on, am I talking to somebody? Un you're unhappy when you see your credit card bill the next week. That's, that's happiness and unhappiness, right? They, they don't know, right? They, they just open up their presents and they throw it around. They break it the next week, but then the, the happy feelings go away in a week's time. See, happiness and joy are two different things altogether. Happiness is based on happenings and events. See, oftentimes a Christian feels like God gives them happiness. Where God says, no, 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 no. When I come into your life and when the Holy Spirit resides within you, what you have is joy. It's much more powerful than happiness because the Holy Spirit is not temporary. The Holy Spirit does not invoke feelings that are temporary. The Holy Spirit does not give you sensations and tingly feelings that are there for a second and goes away later. What the Holy Spirit gives you and what Jesus gives you is lasting. What Jesus gives you is eternal. What Jesus gives you, he looks at you and says, it's something that you can tap into day after day, week after week, month after month, circumstance after circumstance, valley after valley, mountain after mountain, no matter what you're going through, joy will always be present in the Christian. Happiness might not. Happiness might wither. See, joy is an emotion that resides deep inside your, your soul. It's not this fleeting emotion. For the Christian, it's produced by the Holy Spirit. The moment you say yes to Jesus, Jesus just doesn't come into your heart. Joy comes with it. Peace comes with it. Love comes with it. There are so many of these things that define God that come with it. And one of those things is joy. Somebody say joy. See, joy is not fleeting as it's found in a person, not in a circumstance. Joy is, per is, is permanent because joy is found in a person called Jesus Christ. Joy is found in this, this steady force, in this, in this constant thing. When everything else moves and goes away, joy always remains because joy is found in Jesus. The Christmas story is filled with joy. The Bible says the angels were joyful. The shepherds were overjoyed. The wise men were overjoyed. The John, John you know, when, uh, you know, John the Baptist, right? The, the Bible says when, when, when the, the baby left, in, left inside the womb when they, hear, when they heard the good news. You know who was not joyful? Who was not really joyful about the situation? It was the politicians and the religious hypocrites of the day. Go figure. It's the same today. In Luke chapter 1 and verse 46 to 48, there's this beautiful uh, outline of what joy really meant to the Christmas story. And I'm reading from uh, the God's verse, word translation in Luke chapter 1, verse 46, 47, 48. This is what the Bible says. Mary said, my soul praises the Lord's greatness. My spirit finds its joy in God, my Savior. That's good. My spirit finds its joy in God, my Savior. 
Verse 48, because he has looked favorably on me, his humble servant, from now on, all people will call me blessed. My spirit finds joy because he has looked favorably upon me. This is good, y'all. We talked about this last week. The, the meaning of the word Advent, depending upon what church you grew up in, or if you, if you grew up in church, or if you grew up in a traditional uh, church, that a liturgical church, for example, you probably know what the Advent calendar is. Now, for a non-liturgical church like ours, we don't follow the Advent calendar. But simply put, the meaning of the word Advent is coming or arrival. The coming of Jesus was the Advent. We talked about how it's just not in that coming, but there's also Jesus Christ coming back to, for his church, for us, for you, and for me. And that is the advent that we're looking forward towards. See, for some people, their whole life looks like an advent season. I don't know if that's you, but sometimes I feel like, man, my whole life is an advent season of waiting and waiting and waiting. For some of y'all, it's waiting for years. For some of us, it's waiting for, for, for decades. For some of us, it's waiting for months or weeks for some breakthrough to happen. It can be a financial breakthrough. It could be a breakthrough in your education. It could be a breakthrough in relationships. It could be something that you're, you're dealing with and you're like, God, I'm tired of waiting. Anybody in that boat with me where you're like, Lord, I'm tired of waiting? It feels like this waiting process never ends. It feels like we're always in the waiting room of God. And today I want to encourage some of y'all that are waiting that the Advent is more meaningful in the waiting. My question to some of us is, how are you waiting? Are you waiting like how Mary waited? In Psalm 27 verse 14, the Bible says this, wait with hope for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart be courageous. Yes, wait with hope for the Lord. See, waiting with hope is joyful, confident expectation. Like this Advent season, our King is coming. Like we know that. But are you expecting Him? See, some of us can live our lives just looking at the return that we lose focus on the moments that God is trying to connect with you and establish His joy in your life at this very moment. Some of us, it's all about the second coming. Brother, we, all we care about is the second coming. All we care about is Jesus coming back. That we fail to realize that God is trying to connect and have an advent with you day after day. He's trying to come into your lives week after week. He's trying to communicate to you Sunday after Sunday. Through every message that's being spoken. Through every encouraging word. Through every devotional you read. Through every encouragement that comes through people. God is trying to minister to you. And sometimes God comes in the most unexpected and inconvenient ways and inconvenient settings. Sometimes God comes in the most difficult ways and difficult seasons. How many of you have experienced God's advent in the most difficult seasons in your life? Difficult seasons have the way of blinding you to believe that your circumstances really are not conducive for God to work in. How many of you have ever believed that? That, man, I'm too messed up. Or my situation is way too messed up for God to be present in this situation. Some of us translate the, the, the bad stuff that we go through with the absence of God. I want to remind somebody that's far from the truth. The negative stuff that happens to us is not, does not prove the absence of God. In fact, God looks at you and says, man, I've never promised you that if I come into your life, if you have accepted me into your life, you're going to have everything good and dandy. That's not what it guarantees us. Like, will you meet him if he comes in ways that you don't expect him to come? Like, what does that Advent look like for you and for me in our everyday lives? In Philippians chapter 2, verses 6 and 7, the Bible says this, Although he was the form of God and equal with God, he did not take advantage of his equality. Instead, he emptied himself by taking on the form of a servant, by becoming like other humans, by having a human appearance. Like, the first Advent was where he came like a simpleton. Like no one even recognized. No one even knew that this was the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Like Jesus, it's, it's in a manger that Jesus arrived first. Like, like, will you have joy if your miracle comes in a manger? Like here's a woman called Mary. We talked about her last Sunday. But here's a woman that has so much of joy, although her miracle came in a manger. 
Although her miracle came and her breakthrough came in such unimaginable ways that would actually put her to shame, she really saw that she could find joy even in that situation. How many of you have ever been in a situation of, of discomfort? In a situation where, man, man, you, you're like, I don't know what's going to happen to me. I, I don't know what's going to come out of this. I don't know the shame that I'm going to have to endure. I, I, I did this and this and this and this. And I don't know what I have to go through if I... D- How many of y'all have ever been through that? Mary's going through a very similar situation. She's going through a shameful situation where she's pregnant with a child. She's a virgin. She's not even married. In that culture, she could be stoned. But yet, her circumstances told her, man, you should be sad. You should think about running away. You should think about leaving the city. You should think about leaving your family. You're going to bring dishonor to everybody around you. But I want you to hear the turn of events that are about to happen. It's amazing when God's hand is upon you. God can take the most shameful of situations. And situations that doesn't warrant joy. And he can turn it around for your good. Will you have joy if your miracle comes in a manger? This Jesus was not, this miracle was not born in a palace. This promise was not born in a hospital. This miracle was born in a stable and and, and, and placed in a manger. This a feed box for cattle. That's where this miracle was, was placed. There was no joy in the birth. Like, have you taken a second to actually think about that birth? There was there was no family around. Yes, Joseph was there. Baby daddy was there, right? Or not really baby daddy, but daddy was there, right? But, but no family, no nurses around, no epidurals, no baby gifts, no nursery, no newborn pictures, no, no picking out the first outfit, no grandparents to celebrate and take pictures and post on Facebook. Come on, am I talking to somebody? Like a place far away from home. Oh, like what part of this picture screams joy at you? Am I talking to somebody like who wants to have their baby far away from their OBGYN, from their far away from their hospital, far away from their... Anybody here finds joy in that? No. That's not your comfort zone. But here's a man and a woman running for their lives, escaping and they're traveling and in and in. They find a manger and in the manger they find this, 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 this trough. And they put that baby in and nothing screams joy. But joy filled, filled every moment of that experience and that birth and that advent. Even though it looked grim, even though it looked depressing, joy wasn't in the circumstances. It came in spite of the circumstances because of who was born. I want to remind you that today. That I'm... For me, no matter what circumstances I am, I'm going through, no matter if I want to put up the lights or not, no matter if I want to put up the tree or not, no matter what sorrow I've been through, no matter what pain I've been through, no matter who I've lost. Come on, am I talking to somebody? Three days, it was a week ago, sorry, I received the news that my grandmother, my last grandparent, she, she, she's the only living grandparent, she, was, she, she had a stroke and she's on her deathbed and, and they said, call the family, call, call everybody. And, and it was saddening. It was really weighing down on me that this was my last, and and the circumstances were screaming, don't be happy, don't have joy. But God in his infinite mercy looks at me and says, who do you have inside of you? I don't know what you've lost. It could be a person, it could be a job, it could be an opportunity, it could be the opportunity of a lifetime that you let go. But I want to remind somebody that if you choose as a Christian, if you always choose to tap into happiness as opposed to joy, you will be a miserable person. But for the Christian, what he has or she has working for them is the fact that no matter what your circumstance is, Jesus is the is in the center of it all. And if he is this in the center, if he is in the middle, if he is the reason for your season, no matter what you're going through, trust me when I tell you this, you will always choose joy. And joy tells you, go back and remind yourself that God is in total control. No matter what the doctors say. No matter how much it feels sad. And I want to remind somebody, I'm very sensitive in seasons like this. 
to people that have lost loved ones. And I know people, my, my, my friends that are very close to me that have not, got, not gotten, you know, healing from moments like that. It's very insensitive to look at people that, that have probably lost a loved one that was so close to them and say, get over it. I have friends that went through that road and, and, and gone down, and, and I know it's not an easy one to go through, but I want to remind you, joy is in reminding each one of us, in reminding yourself that there is purpose behind every pain is in reminding yourself that, man, you will see them one day. Joy is in tapping into hope that says, no matter what you've lost, no matter who you've lost, no ma you, you lost that job last week? Man, that, that was the perfect opportunity, Pastor. Did you lose it? Let me tell you something. There's another one that God has. We tap into joy. Still be joyful. Still show up to church. Still worship God. Come on. Still do the thing. Still open your word. Still read your word because your joy is not circumstantial. Your joy is permanent. When you have Jesus, you choose joy. There's this extended passage in Luke chapter 1, verse 26 to 38, which I want to kind of go into. The Bible says this, in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, Luke chapter 1, 26 to 38, in the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel to Gabriel, uh, the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee. To a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary, and the angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. The Lord is with you. Verse 29. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this may be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and, bear, and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel. We talked about this last Sunday. Since I'm a virgin, the angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come. Give me one second, sorry. The Holy Spirit will come come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you so the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Verse 36, even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age and she who was said to be unable to conceive in her sixth month so for, uh, is in her sixth month for no word from God will ever fail. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. Can I just say something real quick? Like, Mary doesn't get a whole lot of attention from us Protestants. Like, I don't think, I th I don't think Mary does. And I think we've done a disservice to that. The moment we talk about Mary, it's, it's one of those things where you're like, we don't talk, the Catholics talk about Mary. Let's, let's, let's not talk about Mary. We get very offended. Our defenses go up. But can I contest this morning that there are some life lessons that we can actually learn from Mary? That we can't learn from Moses? who God looked at and said, Moses, I want to use you. And this man looked at him and said, man, I think God, you have the wrong guy. I can't speak. Like we can learn stuff from Mary that we can't learn from Gideon because when God called Gideon, he looked at him and said, Lord, I think you have the long, wrong guy, God. I'm weak. I think you can learn a lot more from Mary than you can learn from Isaiah, who God looked at and said, man, I want to use you. And he looks at God and says, God, I'm sinful. I don't know if I can do it. We can learn a lot more from Mary than from Jeremiah, who God looked at and said, I want to use you. And he said, I'm young, Lord. I don't think you're talking to the right person. We can learn a lot more from Mary than from Jonah, who was very hateful, who said, Lord, I'm a hateful guy. I don't think I'm the right person for the job. Why can we learn a lot more from Mary? Because Mary doesn't, Mary doesn't question God's judgment. Like how many of y'all find, your, find yourself in places opposite to Mary's place? When God tells you to do something, you always want to know why? Why, God? Why? Anybody here? Because that's me. That's me. Why? Like, you're going to understand all of God's plans, right? Like, you want a detailed breakdown, pros and cons. I want a five-year plan, God. Tell me what's going to happen. And God's like, no, bro, you don't need to understand that. But sometimes we're not okay with going forward with what God wants us to do because it really doesn't align up with the way we think. 
It doesn't make sense, God, but it doesn't need to make sense. And I'm, I'm, I'm talking to some people today. See, there are two things over here that I want to talk about. She didn't ask why. She asked how. I'm going to repeat that. She doesn't say why, God. She says, how can this be? Someone once said this, when you ask God why, you're looking for an argument. She didn't ask why. She said, how are we going to do this? Like, get into Mary's shoes for a second. Like, did she know that this was coming? Like, here's a little girl waiting to get married in a teenage years, getting to, waiting to get married. She's ready. She's, you know, she's, she's super excited about this new chapter in her life. And out of nowhere, she hears this angel come up to her and says, man, you are going to have a son. But she's like, Lord, how? Like, I'm a virgin. Right? Not why, God. Why me, God? Anybody been in those shoes? Lord, why me? But I've been in church, God. Why the shame on my family? Why the shame on us? Why did I have to lose my job? Why did I have to do? Why, 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 why? But she says, Lord, just, just tell me how. That's all. Not why. But, and now I'm thinking about that. Like, was it because she knew that this was coming? Like, the only context she had was 700 years ago. The Old Testament prophecy from Isaiah that we read last week in Isaiah chapter 7 and verse 14 that says, Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Like, she cannot be, on that morning when the angel appeared to her, she can be like, I'm a virgin. Like, maybe I'm the one to carry this. Like, like I don't think she ever expected that. I don't think any of the girls back then, it's been 700 years since that prophecy happened. Maybe a year in, they're like, oh, this was a fresh prophecy. We can't wait for this. But 700 years? She's this regular girl from this regular family. Never probably did she ever dream that she, this prophecy would apply to her. But yet she looks at God and says, how can this happen? And she says, may this be done according to your word. Why? Because she was highly favored. That's where the angel looks at her and says, you are highly favored. May your word be done to me. Now, I want to talk about favor for a second. This word, you are highly favored, only occurs twice in the Bible. Only twice in the Bible. You ready for this? The first time is here. And the second time is in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 6. And this is what the Bible says. To the praise of the glory of his grace by which he made us highly favored or accepted in the beloved. Who is the we? We, us, the church. I want us to hear this out. Like you and I have a calling on our lives. You and I have a blessing on our lives that is mighty, that is powerful. Mary doesn't ask why, she asks how. And, and the angel looks at her and says, I'll tell you how. It's because the Holy Spirit has come upon you. It's because the Holy Spirit has come upon you. That phrase, the Holy Spirit has come upon you, also only used two times. Also only used two times. That phrase in, in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8 over here, in, in, in when, she's, when the angel is talking to, to Mary, and in Acts chapter 1 and verse 8 where the Bible says, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. You will be my witnesses telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, throughout Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the world. Just those two places. You and I are highly favored. How, Lord, how am I going to do this? Because the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And both these things apply to Mary and it applied to you and me as Christians and believers today. God is reminding some people today that you are highly favored. That you have a calling on your life. That you have an anointing on your life. That God is calling you for mighty things, for powerful, for powerful things. And I'm asking some of us today, can we do what Mary did in saying, Lord, here I am. Use me, God. I'm going to tap into my joy. Because I want you to go back to what, what she was talking about in that first verse that we read. In, in Luke chapter 1 and verse 46, Mary says, my soul praises the Lord's greatness. 
Lord, I just praise you for your greatness. This song that she's singing, my spirit finds its joy in God, my Savior. So here's the thing. Her spirit had to find that joy. Someone say, find joy. Sometimes joy is suppressed. Sometimes you don't want to be joyful. Sometimes you're like, Lord, no, 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 I don't want you right now. No, I don't want to hear it right now. I don't want that word right now. I don't want that sermon to make sense right now because my circumstances do not really align with what you're saying. It don't make sense. But in those moments, am I talking to somebody? Mary's saying, they're saying, Lord, your word and my circumstances don't make sense. I'm a virgin and I know for a fact, for a fact, for a fact that this is not humanly possible. So this doesn't make sense. Am I talking to somebody? But here's what I'm going to, I'm not going to complain. I'm not going to gripe. I'm not going to verbally say it. Lord, I'm going to ask you how this is possible. But in the middle of that, my spirit, even though my spirit wants to go down and, and go into just this protection mode and go into sobbing mode and crying mode, what does my spirit do? My spirit finds its joy in God, my Savior. Not finds its joy in my doctor, not finds its joy in the report, not finds its joy in my job or my money or my finances. It's going to find its joy in God. Why? Because God said it. I want to remind somebody if God said it, you go and ask him. Some of y'all need to get back to your knees. Some of us need to throw our hands up in the air. Some of us need to get back into the place of worship where we can ask God for your reasoning. This is important, church. He says, my, she says, my spirit finds joy in God, my Savior. How many of you need to find the joy? How many of you need to dig deep right in and pull the joy outside of you? Verse 48, because he has looked favorably on me, his humble servant. From now on, all people will call me blessed. Oh, come on. I need us to understand this. She is declaring over her life the opposite of what her circumstances are about to declare over her. Am I talking to somebody? This, is, th this has to be powerful to you. When you are highly favored and when the Spirit of the Lord is upon you, you have the ability, the Christian has the ability to speak into motion things that can suppress the plans of the enemy. Because here's what's going to happen. The moment she's going to start showing that belly, what are people going to start saying? You are blessed. Am I right? Oh, holy one. Am I right? No. Like, think about it. The conversations that Mary had in the marketplace. This is from God. Yeah, right. Am I talking to someone like, this is, this is some real stuff. Like, and she says, she says, I know people are not going to be calling me blessed, but in the heavenlies, I declare that I am blessed. And because why? You don't, I don't need to reason with you. I don't need to explain because you didn't hear from God. I heard from God. God told me. And because God told me, I will call myself blessed. Some of y'all need to make up your minds today and say that blessing comes from God. And what God has blessed, do not allow one person in your life to curse it, to call it bad, to put it down. It doesn't matter who is in your life. If God has called you blessed, you are highly favored. And this is every Christian. This is every believer. You are highly favored. God's favor is upon you. Somebody say, God's favor is upon me. Some of you all need to remind yourself that, that God's favor is upon you. No matter what your circumstance, no matter what negativity was spoken over you, no matter what that doctor's report was, no matter what your boss told you, no matter what your friend told you, no matter what that, that insult was hurled at you, it doesn't matter. What you say matters. And if you can stand your ground and say, this is what the word tells me about me. This is what God tells me about me. How dare you allow people to tell you stuff about you when God hasn't even said that stuff about you. Ooh. She says, from now on, all people will call me blessed. My spirit finds joy because he has looked favorably upon me. And that's the only reason. I can dig down and my spirit will find joy. Why? Because I have the favor of God upon my life. I am speaking to some people that may not have the favor of man on you. You've missed so many opportunities. You've missed opportunities at work. You've missed opportunities everywhere that you can find. And I want to remind somebody today that God's favor is upon your life. 
when you can come to that conclusion that God's favor is upon you, no, no matter what. Like, and, and let me give you a few things real quick. Let me give you a few. There, there are two things. Two things that Mary probably would have done. The first thing is, that, is this. She probably prepared herself. How do we tap into the promise of great joy? How do we tap into the promise of saying, you know what? God's blessing is upon me. I'm anointed. I'm highly favored. The first thing is prepare yourself. An expectant mother prepares herself. That's what an expectant mother would do. She starts cutting out all the unhealthy practices that she has, the unhealthy food that she's eating. She says no to caffeine, and she says no to alcohol, and she says no to all the things that would potentially cause harm to this baby. Am I talking to somebody? She starts making some lifestyle changes. She starts cutting stuff out of her life because she needs to prepare. Someone say, prepare myself. For some of us, for the Holy Spirit to come upon us, like we talked about earlier, like Mary had, for God's grace to be upon her, for her to have the anointing of God upon her life, Colossians chapter 3, verse 5 to 16 says this, put to death, therefore, whatever belongs to your earthly nature. It could be sexual immorality, it could be impurity, it could be lust, it could be evil desires and greed, which is idolatry. The Bible says this, you used to walk in these ways in the life you once lived, but now you must also rid yourselves of all such things as these, anger, rage, malice, slander, and filthy language from your lips. He says, put that stuff out. And he says, put this on. He says, you have taken off your old self with its practices and have put on your new self, which is being renewed in knowledge in the image of its, crea of its creator. Therefore, as God's chosen people, chosen people, favored people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourself with compassion and kindness and humility and gentleness and patience. Bear with each other and forgive one another. If any of you has a grievance against someone, forgive as the Lord forgave you and over all these virtues put on love which binds them all together in perfect unity prepare yourself and preparing yourself means putting on things that distinguishes you makes you a believer makes you a christian that that sets you apart preparing yourself is important for the favor of god do not do not expect god's favor to be upon you and the holy spirit to move on you if you just live your life the way you want to live it I want to encourage somebody. This Christian life is a life of holiness. It's a life of being set apart. If I cannot distinguish you from your coworker who does not know Jesus, if the words that come out of your mouth is no different from the words that come out of the mouth of a person that doesn't know Jesus, I want to remind somebody you're not set apart. The Holy Spirit does not have a place to move in your life. The favor of God may diminish from your life, but I want to remind somebody, not only are you preparing yourself, but you also have to prepare your environment. That's what an expectant mother does. An expectant mother prepares a nursery and supplies. She, she reads books. She, she baby-proofs the house. The more she prepares, the more ready she is. You know how the Holy Spirit wants us to ready ourselves? It's in 1 Peter chapter number 1 and verse 13 to 16. The message, the message Bible puts it so beautifully. It says this, so roll up your sleeves, get your head in the game, be totally ready to receive the gift that's coming when Jesus arrives. Don't lazily slip back into these old grooves of evil doing just what you feel like doing. You didn't know any better then, you do now. As obedient children, let yourselves be pulled into a way of life shaped by God's life. A life energetic and blazing with holiness. God said, I am holy. You be holy. This is what is going to bring the last, the, the final advent, the return of the king. So many of us are waiting for the return of the king. So many of us are waiting. God, return. Come back, please. We want you to come back. Sonia always jokes about it and says that, man, I, I can't wait for the Lord to come back. And, and she said, before I got married, she, 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 she said that before she got married, she said, Lord, I just want to see who my husband's going to be. And after that, you can come. <laughs> and in 2014, I was like, okay, Lord, let's come. Let's, let's, get, let's, let's, let's get this done with. Sonia's been praying. And then she changed her prayer and she said, Lord, uh, 
I know I said after I got married, I just wanted to see what my husband looks like, but okay, I, I guess he looks like that, but I, I want, I want, <laughs> come after I see what my first child looks like. And then Michaela was born. I'm like, okay, Lord, we're ready for you to come. And she's like, no, 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 no. I just want to see what her husband then looks like. And, and you know, this, 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 this cycle just keeps going. I'm like, oh, I give up right now. But so many of us are like anxiously waiting for God to come back. We're so anxiously waiting for the second coming. And God's like, man, like, like have we even asked ourselves, like, why? Like, are we ready? Like the people in this sitting over here, are you ready? Does every person sitting over here have a personal relationship with Jesus? That's what he desires. I want to remind everybody, Jesus desires that he has a personal relationship with you. Like are you satisfied with knowing about Jesus or do you want to know Jesus intimately? Like all of us can wait for the second coming, but God's like, man, I want you to prepare yourselves, prepare your atmosphere, prepare your home, prepare your life. If you have said, Jesus, come into my life, take the next step. Say, I want to be baptized, Lord. I want to identify with you. And I, I urge you guys to do this week after week, but some of us need to make decisions. Robin, you can come up on the keys. This is applicable to the return of the king. That's what the Bible says. Roll up your sleeves, get your head in the game, be totally ready to receive the gift that's coming when Jesus arrives. Like, are you ready for that gift? Are you ready for the advent? Are you ready for the return? And sometimes that's as simple as filling your house with, with, with worship. It's filling your house with the word. In Psalm 27, verse 14, the Bible says this, wait with hope for the Lord. Be strong. Let your hearts be courageous. Yes, wait with hope for the Lord. Some of us, our waiting can be so long. For, for some of us, it's waiting for breakthrough and deliverance and healing. But I want you to look at the hope of glory as you wait. I talked to people that have lost loved ones earlier. And I want to reiterate that one more time and say, I know you've probably lost a big chunk of your life. And it's so hard for you to celebrate this season as you should or you probably did at one point in time. But I want to remind you something. This verse reminds me this. Wait with hope for the Lord. Remember your waiting is not in vain. In vain. Your waiting reminds you that you have a hope in Jesus Christ. Your waiting reminds you that one day you will see your loved one again. If they love Jesus the same way you love Jesus, remind yourself that one day you will see them once again. That's the hope of eternal life. Wait with hope. Would you stand up to your feet with me, church? But for others of us, it's this life. It's the struggles and the pain of this life. It's the constant struggle of this life. You're not able to catch a break at all. When's the last time that you came out of your situation and you're like, Lord, thank you, Lord. I, 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 I don't ever want to go through what I just experienced ever again. I remember... A few weeks ago when our kids were finally well and the runny noses had stopped running and, you know, the flu had just seized and there were no more fevers and the five days of continuous fevers had stopped and the thermometer read normal again. I remember Sonia and I looking at each other and saying, Lord, can this never again happen because this was so stressful. And I know for some of y'all, you're like, oh, get over it. It was just a flu. For, for others of us, it's not the flu or the or fever. For some of us, it's a life-threatening disease and a sickness. For some of us, it's bad news. For some of us, it's a loved one that's dealing with cancer. And the ability to tap into joy. Pastor, I know you say joy, but it's so hard to tap into joy when everything seems to be falling apart. For some of us, it's caring for somebody with 
that's older. For, somebody, for some of us, it's caring for somebody that's, that can't care for themselves. There are so many people that have depended upon you and you're just burnt out. You're just burnt out. You don't know how to keep going and you don't know how to find joy. It's bigger than a Christmas message, y'all. It's, it's bigger than that. I want to encourage somebody that's going through a circumstance that Mary was going through, an impossible situation, a situation that warranted scorn, a situation that, that was, that was scorn-worthy, that was intimidating, a situation that was disgraceful to say the least. The ability that this teenage girl, this not a strong Christian, not, not a priest, not a, not a worship leader, this teenage regular girl, this teenage girl that had no idea that the favor of God was upon her, the ability that she had to tap into her spirit and to sing this song is so powerful to me, is so, is so encouraging to me. That she would say, spirit, my, my, my spirit, my spirit, I will, I will have my spirit. I will tap into my spirit. Whew, this is so good. And I'm asking some of us today, is that, is that going to be you? Some of y'all are going to sing that song of Mary which says, Lord, my soul praises the Lord's greatness. Yes, Lord, even in my impossibility, I will praise your greatness. Even when I lose that relationship, I will praise your greatness. Even when people speak down on me from now on, I declare that because you have looked up on me, all people will call me blessed. Your favor will be upon me. I'm encouraging some of y'all to make those declarations of faith and saying, God's spirit is upon my life. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I'm going to have the worship team come out and lead us in a few moments of worship, but I'm going to be available for prayer for those of y'all who want to spend a few moments in prayer. But I believe in my heart that some of us need to reconcile. Some of us need to make some decisions today. Some of y'all have been holding yourselves back because you haven't been able to tap into the goodness of God, to tap into that joy because of your circumstances. Either that shameful circumstance, either that, 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 that relationship that went sour, some of y'all, it's the loss of that loved one that you just are still struggling with even till this day. I don't want to downplay it. I don't want to dismiss it. It's some, one of the most sensitive things, but I want to ask you today, would you tell yourself that God looks at you as highly favored? Tell yourself today that God looks at you as somebody that he loves dearly. And although you may have lost that person that was so closest to your heart, I want to remind you that my God is closer to you than he has ever been. And today, I'm asking you to tap into that goodness. I want you to tap into his greatness. I want you to tap into your spirit and remind your spirit that you have to find that joy in God. joy that you found in people, that joy that you found in things and individuals and the job and the finances and the money and it all went away and joy went with it and that's the thing about happiness if you put your happiness in things and substances and material things, when they disappear happiness goes with it or if you even put your joy in those things, when those things disappear, it goes with it but let me tell you about this Jesus he hasn't left, he doesn't intend to leave, he is with you even till the end of time, that's what the word reminds you. He says, lo and behold, I will be with you. Even though your own mother forsakes you, I will not forsake you. That's the word of God. I will be with you. Emmanuel. And that Emmanuel is asking you to tap into joy.
Choose joy. Pick joy every single time. Choose joy, even in the impossible situation. Say, God has got this. I will put my trust in Jesus, the anchor to my soul. Everything around me will fail, but I know what will not fail. His name is Jesus. Thank you for listening. We love bringing you the word on so many different platforms. We are so thankful for what God is doing in and through us. We'd love for you to subscribe so you don't miss out. And don't forget to share this message if it has blessed you.